Welcome back to the Capital 10X interview series. We've been covering psychedelics since scientific research was reopened for institutions and the inception of a number of psychedelic related IPOs brought a new growth industry for investment. To get a sense of the overall direction of the market and opportunities, we're pleased to speak with James Lantier, the CEO of a biotech psychedelics company, Mindset Pharma. So James, looking down the psychedelic supply chain, what are your thoughts on the capital and resources being expended for treatment clinics and therapy? Great, great question. So, um, you know, w w when we talk about kind of the medical psychedelic space, it's, you know, it, the, w when we use a few more words to describe it, you know, often the term is, you know, medically or, you know, psychedelic, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, right? So, so psychedelic assisted is, is one part and, and that's the most unique part. And that's this idea of using, uh, you know, a psychedelic drug as really, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, kind of like a catalyst to help, um, you know, help you, you know, potentially, you know, access some, some, uh, you know, traumatic memories or, you know, help you, uh, you know, help you sort of think more expansively about, uh, you know, life, your life and your, you know, your place in it. But, but the other, you know, part of that phrase is, uh, you know, is, is the psychotherapy. And it, I think it's important to, to remember that we're, we're still very much at the, the early stages of this psychedelic renaissance. And there's lots of questions that still, you know, need to get answered more precisely. Um, and those are going to kind of help shape how the well, how the future you know looks uh, of the space, but um, but right now all of the data um, around um, the medical use of psychedelics has it has this therapy component. So typically, where you know you are getting some uh, some some therapy or some you know some preparation before your your sessions with the psychedelic drugs, and then you know you have usually a therapist or or therapy therapist type people in the room with you and then um you know therapy afterwards to help you kind of integrate your experiences and and so there's if if you, you, you the medical psychedelic umbrella is a pretty big umbrella there's drug discovery companies like mindset and drug development companies which I also put mindset in um and then, you know, the, the other side of this is, is the therapy side. And I think, um, you know, that we're going to see a lot more interest and investment in that um, as the first generation psychedelic drugs start to get approved in the next, um, you know, sort of 12 to 24 months, you know, we're probably not that far away from MDMA getting approved. And then, you know, psilocybin sometime after shortly after that, and then on the heels of those drugs, you'll get um, you know, the second, uh, generation drugs, you know, getting approved, um, there already is an infrastructure in, uh, in North America in the form of, you know, of, of clinics that deliver ketamine to patients or administer ketamine to patients. Um, so it could very well be that those are, you know, are also, where, you know, other psychedelic drugs end up being, you know, dosed to patients, or they could be in, you know, totally new, more, uh, you know, purpose-built uh, clinics. From our standpoint, uh, you know, the therapy and clinic side is really important, but, um, you know, we felt like um, there was a, a huge opportunity on, you know, on the drug side where things like you know, intellectual property and being able to develop a drug that, you know, is maybe not first in class, but best in class um, have, you know, the potential to create really, you know, enormous returns. And of course, also, we think that with second generation drugs, there's an even better opportunity to help patients. So if you're an investor just beginning their due diligence on psychedelics, how would you approach the sector? Yeah, uh, it's a great Another great question, and I think that the um, the it's it, sure it's it's useful and good to start to learn about the different psychedelic drugs and to start to 
you know, do a little bit of research into the the therapeutic, you know, effect and, and read, you know, some of the studies or the summaries of the studies. But I think for investors to really, you know, get a, a better appreciation for, um, you know, where they should potentially focus um, and, and, uh, and, and sort of how to do the homework is, is to kind of actually look at, at other industries and look at other, look at, you know, look at the pharmaceutical business and look at, you know, different, you know, fields of, of, uh, of the pharmaceutical business where there's been, you know, innovation and in, you know, psychiatry or, you know, oncology and, and kind of look at, at how, you know, if you look at the growth of, you know, antidepressants, uh, SSRIs, um, you know, uh, I think that's a, that's potentially, you know, pretty, you know, instructive, you know, I think, you know, the, the, that's going to be more useful for kind of getting a handle on what are the likely waves and kind of growth in psychedelics to be, and where is the value going to be created than say cannabis, which, you know, as we've talked about before, I don't think is really not um, a very, you know, useful, comparable for psychedelic medicine at a 120,000 foot level, you know, up beyond even the balloons. Um, that is, uh, you know, they're, they're similar at a very high level and that, you know, cannabis was a, you know, a naturally occurring substance that was prohibited and now is legal in, in a lot of places. And, psilocybin mushrooms were illegal still are illegal for the most part but have momentum to become legal in a lot of a lot of uh you know places but that's really where the similarities end in a lot of ways you know there, there might be a lot of overlap between recreational users but that's not relevant they're, they're headed in two totally different directions a lot of the medical exploration the scientific exploration of cannabis for medical uses a lot of that work really kind of the momentum went out of it once it got approved for, you know, adult recreational use. James, what do you think of investor comparisons to psychedelics and cannabis? In psychedelics, the momentum, if you, if you look at where kind of the momentum is and the gains that have been, you know, made in, um, in, in getting them uh, legalized or accepted by regulators, the momentum really is on the medical side, whereas in cannabis, uh, it's it's the, the sort of the medical horse has left the barn with cannabis in a lot of ways, and and cannabis is 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 at least in most of North America recreationally, it's here to stay, and the, and that's how it's going to be, you know, used. That's not to say, you know, a lot of people feel like it's really important to them. Uh, a lot of people feel like alcohol is really important to them. <laughs> the psychedelics, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of people who feel that psychedelic drugs are really important to them, and understandably. Um, but really, because of of how you know how how strong and and how they can be, and in some cases, how long the effects uh, are, um, there's you know, we may well eventually see a future where psychedelic drugs are available recreationally, but I do think we're a ways away from that today. And what has broad support from regulators, and, you know, even if you look at the USA from a kind of across the political spectrum, is the the medical, you know, the medical use. So I think, Certainly, it's it's interesting to look at businesses that are are you know focused on the eventual recreational use of psychedelic drugs, but um, but it's harder at this stage to see your way through as an investor to a viable business model on the recreational side. The 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 much more viable you know near term business models are around the the medical use. According to some analysts, funding was relatively poor in 2022, other than significant deals like Mindset's partnership with Itsuka. Where do you believe the institutional and venture capitalist interest lies in 2023 and beyond? It's really important to situate the medical psychedelic companies within the overall uh, you know, biotech market, because at that, that it is the biotech uh, you know universe that is going to 
you know, feed and invest in and, you know, nurture, develop, um, you know, promising psychedelic assets. Um, a lot of the funding that came before uh, in, you know, 2020, 2021, a lot of this was, uh, you know, you know, some of it was, or, you know, you know, kind of can cannabis investors, cannabis money. Um, and while it may feel like the funding in 2022, you know, went, went down and there may have been fewer financings, what isn't totally apparent to outsiders is that you're now, you now have, um, we've started with, you know, now the creation of setup of a, a whole sort of series of you know, psychedelic VCs that are really focused on the psychedelic, uh, you know, space. Some of them were around previously, but you know, there's there's a lot more that have like formed now and have, have raised more capital and are you know taking a, a pretty disciplined approach to how they uh and where they you know invest their capital. And then um what's what's really important is that again, the, the biotech kind of ecosystem is also moving moving forward. And you know, how how do they finance and advance companies? Well. Um, there's really, you know, two constituencies. There's, you know, institutional biotech funds, and and then there's the pharma companies themselves that will partner with promising biotech companies to help them, you know, advance their drugs and and participate in them, you know, strategically. We were really fortunate to be able to strike the first, you know, pharma partnership in the space. But what I can tell you is that there's now, you know, quite an elevated level of interest from, you know, the broader pharma uh, world beyond uh, just Otsuka in this class of drugs, lots more interest. And, and now, you know, you're also starting to see, um, you know, biotech funds are, are, are really, you know, getting interested as well. Their interest, like we've been saying all along, is much more on the novel drug side so drugs that have actual you know strong ip protection then it is on um the first generation drugs there are investors in first generation drugs um but the generally speaking pharma wants drugs that have strong ip protection which you really it's much harder to get with with drugs like psilocybin or, or mdma you, you can't patent the underlying molecule so you you try to patent stuff around it, and none of that protection is is quite as strong as under owning the underlying uh, you know molecule. So I think that there's that there was a little bit of a uh, uh, decline in financings in 2022. Isn't indicative of the interest of the broader biotech ecosystem in the in the space. It's just that the programs need to move forward, and so what you're going to start to see is a lot more partnerships and a lot more biotech institutional investment coming into the space because the programs have moved forward. And typically most programs don't get partnered at a preclinical stage in pharma. They get partnered after, after phase one at phase two, there's, there are more partnerships happening earlier, but that historically wasn't the norm. Historically they happen once you get past phase one and there will be a bunch of different programs, not only mindsets, but others that are kind of moving through, you know, phase one into phase two. And I think you'll start to see a lot more real biotech investment and pharma partnerships in the space. And I think all of that is going to have the effect of attracting attention from, you know, the wider market as well. Great insights. Thanks, James. Bye.